Good evening. It's time to start. If you would stand, please. We're going to do a little bit of He Lives. Serve the risen Savior. He lives in the world today. Here we go. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. Whatever man may say, I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me. I'm on my narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to singing. You may be seated. Count your many blessings. Name them. Thank you. 
beautiful hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God, my We, uh, we're going to read uh, again the Gospels tonight and we're going to read some things that challenge our way of thinking, our way of understanding the world. Father, we pray for you to give us wisdom and comprehension and understanding that we, we, may not, we might apply your word to our lives and our world today. We open our minds to you. We also pray, Lord, for our this great country, the great United States of America. We pray for those men and women who are serving our country uh, in, in the Army, uh, Navy, Marines, uh, Coast Guard, the Air Force, all those military, but also, Lord, those who are serving in political places, those who've been elected to office to represent us. Lord, we pray that you'll work in their life. Lord, we pray for uh, a, a prayer just to cover... Um, those people tonight that are serving our country. Lord, that they might hear your voice tonight. And for those who are walking far from you, Lord, I pray that there will be a witness there close by to speak a, a word of truth into their lives. I pray, Father, for those who are uh, serving our country and they're uh, walking with you, Lord, would you give them success in the great commission where they are to make disciples of their colleagues and co-workers. Lord, let us as America come back to you. We long to be one nation under God, indivisible. We pray, Father, for the world, for we know that there are many, many people who do not know you, do not know about Jesus at all. And so we pray for those missionaries who are out there giving their lives tonight, some of them risking their lives, their health, to serve you in the difficult places. We pray, Father, for their patience, for their strength, for their health, for their voices to be strong and true and faithful. Lord, we pray 
for a great revival all over the world. Now, Lord, as we look to you tonight, we look at the Gospels, and we want to walk with Jesus. We want to rub shoulders with him. We want to bow at his feet. We want to hear his voice, teaching, speaking, preaching, speaking truth into our lives. Lord, we, we claim it tonight, your truth into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I've got some slides for you tonight. I'm going to point out where we are again. Here's where we are. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to go across the lake. Uh, we're going to talk to the fellow known as the Gerasene demoniac. Any of you met any demoniacs lately? The world is full of them. Yeah. People who are controlled by demon, by Satan. They've given their lives to evil. They're, they're everywhere. And so we're going to look, again, we're looking at all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. We'll focus primarily on Luke, I think. Um, and, and again, here, here we struggle with um, uh, three different gospels, and they, they may take a different look um, because, again, they're speaking to a different audience, each of them. And so they may present things a little bit differently, and we'll, we'll try to understand some of those challenges tonight. Uh, if you will, go to the next slide, a couple of maps again. Uh, over here we have the Sea of Galilee, and this is just a blow-up of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, remember that we, we're headquartered out of Capernaum, right? Uh, and we're going we're gonna to cross the lake by night, tonight, and uh, go across over here to the land of the Gerasenes or the Gadarenes. Or, and and uh, one of the things I want you to keep in mind I don't think, no, we're not coming back to this map, so remember the Decapolis. We talked about that last time we were together, right? Deca means what? Ten, and polis, city. So the, the area of ten cities, what kind of cities? Greek cities. Remember, remember uh, you don't see Israel up there anywhere, do you? Israel is not a nation any longer. It's under the control of Rome, the Greco-Roman world. Um, the, the, many of the rulers are trying to Hellenize. Hellenize means to influence it toward this Greek culture, right? Uh, and so uh, they're pushing the Greek language. It's not the Greek spoken today. When we, do y'all want to go back to Greece next year maybe? Yeah. Uh, when, when you go to Greece, if you, if you learn to read the New Testament in the Koine, the common Greek, um, that would not help you a whole lot in modern Greek. The Koine Greek, New Testament, the dead language. Unlike Hebrew, that they've this kept alive all these centuries and centuries. So remember the Decapolis, because um, uh, that's going to come up in a minute. Uh, Decapolis is a big region, big area. Uh, we might think of it as like what the uh, central Texas or something. Not not to say that it's the same geographic uh, size, but a, an, an area, a large area, ten city area. Okay, so we're going to start at um, headquarters in Capernaum, and we're going to go across to uh, Gadara, um, and and notice down here Gadara, and so there, there's a question about where where did they go when they crossed the lake? Where did they go? We're, uh, there are different uh, options, but we're going to go. Go ahead with me to the, uh, well, again, here, just, just the enlargement of the lake. Uh, the lake is, I think, it, I think I remember that it's eight miles across. And so if we go from here to there, we're looking at what, six, seven miles? Uh, any of you like rowing? Uh, get, get, your, get your shoulders loosened up because we, we're going to row across the lake here in a minute. Um, do you like being out on the lake at night? And remember, there are no lights, no city lights. All you've got are the stars, if it's not cloudy. And I, I think we'll learn that it was not only cloudy, but a storm. So let, let's look. Uh, we're going to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. We'll begin in verse 26, I think it is there. Let me go to Luke chapter uh, 8. 26. I hope you're bringing your Bibles, maybe making some marks. You know, I, I got the, um, a great comment, compliment, comment 
recently. Somebody, who, one of you, I think it was, said um, that I sometimes say things that maybe you've heard before, but say it in a different way, and it strikes a chord with you. Well, good, good. Uh, if I'm not saying something uh, new or different, um, then I need to go back to my studies. Yeah. <clears throat> so, back to Capernaum. We are going to take a tour around Galilee. Um, remember all the synoptic gospels. They come at it from a little different perspective. Most likely, my guess, or scholars, uh, commentaries, say that um, it would probably take about three or four hours to go uh, across the lake from Capernaum down to uh, here, probably where they, where they cross the lake to go to Gethsera. Uh, so three or four hours uh, rowing across the lake, five or six miles. Um, and it, it, so if they left Capernaum 6 or 7 p.m., then by the time they got there, it's at least 9 p.m., maybe as late as midnight. Okay? Um, so the land, notice that it's opposite of, of Galilee, right? Go, go back again to the map, and let me show you one more time. Uh, so so here, here's... The land where the, the Jewish people are still dominant o over here, right? Um, th today, this is Jordan, right? But o over here would have been the land of the Gentiles. Um, and thus, we're going to run into some uh, animals that uh, you wouldn't typically expect to find in Jewish territory. Yeah, because they're... And again, it's important to think about Jesus. Jesus ministered not just to the Jewish people, but he went across, um, went, went through Samaria and over here in... in um, the land of the Gentiles. That, that's, that's important to us. And so Matthew, Matthew calls it Gadara, G-A-D-A-R-A, -A, rather than Gadara. Um, Gadara is a well-known city. Uh, it's about seven miles off the lake, off the shore, so it's a, a more inland. Um, and then there's a smaller city uh, called Gadara, Gerasa, excuse me, Gerasa, uh, probably where Jesus landed. Now, it's important to um, think about where Jesus landed because of what happens there, you know, with the swine, the pigs running into the ocean, fall, falling off the cliff, uh, running into the ocean. Um, did you, I don't know that, I've never seen it myself, but I was told, by the way, um, I think it was when I was um, third or fourth grade, I was in 4-H. You remember head, heart, health, and hands, you know, 4-H, the agricultural kind of thing. I was in four, and I, I showed my pig in the, in the show, 4-H show. Um, but one of the things I learned was that you never want to uh, get a pig uh, hot, you know, as in you know, running and, you know, like you would, and then let them run off into the creek or pond or whatever because it would kill them. That's what I was told. I, I didn't try it. But, but think about it. Um, is, is that part of what was happening here, these swine that run off, and, and, but they all, 2,000 of them died. So um, it's, the question is, where did Jesus and his disciples land? Uh, the scripture said that there's other boats with them, right? Or at least one of the gospels do. So uh, he's, he's going across the lake um, in part to get away from the crowds. But that's another good question that we'll think about later perhaps is, why did Jesus cross the lake? Hmm, good question. And so, uh, let's go, go to the next slides now. So here's, here's, um, here's the lake. This is from uh, over on the um, Jewish side of the lake, right? Looking, looking across the lake. In fact, that's, that's the place where they believe Jesus met the disciples and restored Peter. Yeah. And the next slide is uh, we'll go across the lake and see there's, there's those... Mountains, hills, whatever you want to call it. Uh, remember, the, uh, there's a, a, a rift, you know, an um, earthquake. It resulted in a fault there, and that's what created the uh, Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee. And so the Sea of Galilee is below sea level, going down to the Dead Sea, and it's much, much lower. Um, but again, mountains around. And so these mountains are a lot like, remember, ge geographically, they're, wait a minute, that's not the right word. As far as their makeup, they're a lot like our territory, limestone, soft, soft stone. And so there's a lot of caves 
And people, uh, especially poor people, might, make, might live in these caves, or at least for, for a short time. So uh, it would not be uncommon, uh, as I understand it, to find people in these caves. But also we know that they use caves for tombs as well. Um, Matthew says that there were two demon-possessed men, uh, Luke and Mark focused their attention on just one of them, uh, one who did all, all the speaking when Jesus uh, encountered them. And so the one that did come to Jesus came, um, comes at, you know, running up to Jesus and falls at his feet. Now, so what is a demoniac? Person who is controlled by a demon. Here, here's a description of them, uh, of a person who is a demoniac based on what you learn from the New Testament. This, this guy is, he's in the nude, right? He's naked, yeah. Um, so he has a, a, a disregard for his personal dignity. Uh, he, maybe, he, maybe he's not even aware that he's naked. Uh, so he, he's social isolation, so he's, he's, he doesn't live in town, doesn't live in a village. He, he's out all, all by himself, or maybe uh, a small group of them. Um, he, he's no longer living in a home, but he's in some sort of shelter, cave, whatever. Uh, he recognizes, when Jesus approaches, he recognizes Jesus', Jesus deity, that he is God. Um, it appears that there's some sort of spirit, demon, controlling his speech. Uh, he does a lot of shouting. He has extraordinary strength because it's described as a fellow who's tearing chains apart. Uh, very, very powerful. And um, he is perhaps homicidal, would hurt other people, and definitely suicidal in the sense that he's harmed himself. Um, but he is able to talk. And people talk about him. So can you imagine having this guy as one of your, in your neighborhood? You, most likely when you got together for coffee and uh, cards and golf, whatever, you'd, you'd probably be talking about this guy. He's the talk of the town. He's the terror of the town. In fact, he probably comes around at night scratching on your screens of your windows, right? Do you hear anything tonight? I'm going to Luke chapter 8. We're going to read that text. Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 20, 26 there. Luke 8, 26. They, they sailed, that is Jesus and his disciples, and we know there were other boats that sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. And when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. Now, I'm reading from the New International Version, in case you're wondering. For a long time unspecified length of time this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house but had lived in the tombs cave and when he saw Jesus he cried out screamed fell uh, at Jesus feet shouting at the top of his voice what do you want with me Jesus son of the most high God I beg you don't torment me so uh, was it the man speaking or this demon speaking uh, if it was the demon demons, plural speaking, uh, then they were using the man's vocal cords to do so. Jesus had commanded the evil spirit, demon, to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. Notice there he, he, he refers to a singular. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. So he's, he's a loner. He's out there. Jesus asked him, what's your name? As if he didn't know already. Legion, the man replied, because many demons had gone into him. So it's not just one demon, it's many um, but I, I, I just, it occurred to me that the way Luke presents it, and remember Luke's, uh, what, medical doctor, scientist, scientist type? He says um, uh, many had gone into him, uh, but he didn't say anything about coming out of him. And they begged him, they, they, that is the evil spirits, demons, 
begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. And a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. Do, do, do you see the hillside? Do you see the little pigs up there? Yeah. Oink, oink, oink. Um, again, tr try to put yourself there with Jesus, with his disciples, and you, you hear this man screaming and uh, screaming at Jesus. And there's these pigs, um, people tending the pigs. On the, a large herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into them, that is, let the demons go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. And when the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep banks into the lake and was drowned. And when those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside. So they, they, um, they got the word out through the grapevine real quick. And the people, that is the people of the town, the countryside, went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed. What is he dressed in? Did Jesus give him something? Uh, disciples give him something to put on? Uh, uh, he's dressed now, and he's in his right mind in contrast to being um, controlled, his mind being controlled by these demons. He's in his right mind. He's at peace. And they, that is the people who came out to see what's going on, were afraid. Verse 36, those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. So there were witnesses, and they reported what Jesus had done, he gave them, gave the demons permission to go into the pigs. The pigs ran into the water, they were drowned, and, and the demons are gone. And so, then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and he told all over, the, all over town uh, how much Jesus had done for him. Uh, one of the other gospels says, All over the Decapolis. So here again, um, the, the, the man with these demons uh, calls Jesus the Son of the Most High God. In other words, Jesus, um, Jehovah, Most High God. Um, Old Testament term for God himself, covenant God. And this fellow, had a, a, he has a, um, maybe a long list of names, but he, he, he says, I'm, I'm legion. Now that's a good Greek concept, right? Legion. It refers to um, um, a, a Roman army of about 6,000 Men, I, I, I doubt seriously that, um, that Luke, or the gospel writers, were trying to be specific about the number. That I think the point is that this dude was bad off. He didn't just have one diagnosis. He, he, was, he was really sick. In fact, he was sick in the kind of way that um, people wouldn't want to be around him even if they could. The demons have Jesus way outnumbered, don't they? Um, whether they're 6,000, 2,000, whatever it is, they, there's a host of them. And yet Jesus is able to say, go. Maybe he's trying to tell us about how um, he has power over our problems too. How big are your problems? Mm. Uh, um, Jesus has power, authority. All. In, in fact, didn't, didn't he say, Jesus say in the last few verses of Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth been given to me? Go therefore and make disciples. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he says uh, that these demons, they don't, they, they don't want to go to the abyss. Uh, have, you, have you been there before? Is there, is there a place in Texas called Abyss, Texas? You hadn't been there yet? Uh, abyss, good, good word, um, means a, the A is a, a, in Greek an alpha, alpha, privative. It means 
not. And this is the word for bottom. There's not a bottom. No bottom. It's a bottomless pit. Well, that word was used in, in, in the Hebrew, in the, in the Jewish thinking, to refer to the uh, place of the dead, the abode of the dead. Where do they go? This is just a bottomless pit. And um, these demons evidently know that that's where they're going eventually. And, and um, Jesus, they, they ask not to be thrown into the abyss, but go into the pigs, and so that's where they go. The Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 1 through 3 and verse 10, uh, remind us, John reminds us, Jesus reminds us, that uh, Satan and all his cronies, cohorts, others, they will eventually be locked up in the abyss, the bottomless pit. 2,000 pigs. Um, remember, Jewish, Jewish people, we don't do pig, right? We don't eat pork, right? And so... Um, these definitely aren't um, Jewish shepherds out there, uh, but all 2,000 of them evidently off into the lake and die. I wonder if, if, um, if your livelihood, you're the owner of the swine herd, uh, suddenly gone, what would you think about that? Yeah. Financial loss, big time, yeah. Um, and, and so all, t all 2,000 of them are gone, dead. Um, and for the first time in we don't know how long, this man who has um, been a harm to himself, perhaps others um, living out alone, lonely, apart from family, apart from, uh, he's free. He's at peace. I think there's a good, that's a, there's a good um, symbolism there of a person who's lost without Christ and does not have the peace of God in their life, may be tormented by circumstances of life and such, that when you are set, for, when we are set free by Christ, we are free indeed, whether it be 2,000 demons or whatever, but there he is, um, the townspeople see him and he's sitting there in his right mind with clothes on and um, you'd think they would all want to run up and hug his neck and say, so glad you're healed. And, but instead, their focus is on Jesus and getting rid of him. This is the saddest story to me in the whole Bible. It, it's it's, it's somewhat equivalent to those who hung Jesus on the cross. They sent Jesus away. Sad indeed. They're afraid. I, I don't, I'm not sure what they're afraid of mostly, whether it's afraid of the fact that, hey, we couldn't control that one guy, the demoniac, and now here's somebody who can actually control him Whoa, we're afraid of that power, that authority? Or is it the, the financial thing? That fellow just cost us how many dollars? You know, there have been many, many, many people who said no to Jesus for financial reasons. In fact, they still do today. In fact, I would argue that there are Christians today who won't let Jesus have control of their finances and to the degree that we don't allow them to have control of that part of our lives we're not free I disagree with that old preacher who used to say if he's not Lord of all he's not Lord at all well he's Lord but have we given him control it is possible for us to harbor certain areas of our lives where we, we want to keep, keep the reins in that part. Oh, yeah, we may praise the Lord on Sunday morning and say hallelujah and whatever and just rejoice. And, and, but then when we get back home, ooh, we make sure that we, we're going to keep that part. 
we don't trust him with all of our lives. Um, here, here's a, an example of that. A community decision that the gospel writers say. It, this was not just one person who said, uh, we, we don't, I don't want you around here. You, you caused all my pigs to die and my income. And I'm not going to be able to send my boys to college because you're what... No, it, it was a community decision. They sent him away. So it is that's true today. But this um, ex or former demoniac, he wants to go with Jesus. Can you put yourself in his shoes? Why would you want to go with Jesus? Well, I, I want to get away from what all that reminds me of my past. Some of you can identify with that. You've got some baggage, some stuff in your past, some history, some life experience that just, you just want to leave it buried. Maybe you've not dealt with it. Maybe he wants to go with Jesus because he wants to show his gratitude. Maybe he wants to serve him because he recognizes him as Jesus, the Lord of life, the Son of God. Yeah, maybe. And yet Jesus says, no, that's not my plan for you. I want you to go home. And I want you to do two things. Can you imagine going back home? Everybody's going to see you and they're going to think, oh, that's the guy that cost us 2,000 pigs. You'll never outlive that, will you? That's the fellow that caused the financial ruin of our whole community. Yeah. Or they'll recognize the scars on your hands and maybe your face where you cut yourself when you were a crazy man. And you'll always be that, that man. You'll never be able to live it down. Maybe you don't want to go back there, but Jesus says, go back with your scars, with your reputation, and show the people. One, I want you to go home to your people and report to them what the Lord has done for you. And what did he do? Gave him his mind. Gave him his freedom. Gave him life. Gave him another chance at life. Gave him grace. I want you to go home and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. Mercy, they say, is when God does not give you what you deserve. You know, based on this man's goodness and whatever, he, he didn't deserve to be freed, set, set free or loosened from these demons, but God didn't give him what he deserved. He gave him what God wanted, him for, wanted for him. And so the man, um, he, he goes, he, he does what Jesus said. He goes back home. Um, and between what the man begins to do, telling uh, his people what the Lord's done for him, how, they, how they, he had mercy on him, and what the other community people are saying about this Jesus from across the lake, um, the Bible says that the whole Decapolis, the ten city area, they learned about Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. I think that's one of our biggest challenges as the church is to remember that that is our privilege as well as our responsibility to go home to our people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for us and how he had mercy on us. It, it is our opportunity to tell people uh, that Jesus saved us from our pig-infested life. You know, we smell like swine. And yet Jesus came to us right where we were, in the hog waller of life, and rescued us, set us free. That's our story to tell. And when we tell our story, the Holy Spirit uses that to convict other people's hearts that, hey, yeah, I've got mud on my face too. Would Jesus set me free? Yes, he will. By his grace, he does. 
a wonderful story outside of town, we'd say, across the lake. Um, a good story for us to tell others that have not come to know him. So the, the next time, we'll, we'll talk about that later, the next time that Jesus comes to the Decapolis area, um, he gets a wonderful reception. In fact, people, 4,000 people gather around and he feeds them. Uh, I, I think greatly due to the fact that um, what Jesus did when he crossed the lake. And, and isn't this, let's go back to the, why did Jesus go across the lake? If you read the portion just before this story, he was being overwhelmed by crowds. They were just crushing him, right? And so in, in part, maybe he went across the lake to, to just get, just a rest. But he didn't get it, did he? I mean, there was somebody waiting on him when he got across the lake. There were other boats with him following him. He didn't get away from the crowd. So we could, we could argue that, no, he, he probably didn't intend to go across the lake to get away so much as he went to meet this man. We'll see in the next story that um, it, it, Jesus has an awareness that's beyond our comprehension that Jesus is able to know stuff that, humanly speaking, we, we can't explain. It's only by his divine nature uh, we would say that he's able to know these things. Like um, the story we'll get to later about being touched, his garment being touched, and a woman healed by that. And he said, who touched me? Well, he, I think he knew already. In fact, I think he's looking at the woman eyeball to eyeball whenever he asks that question. It's a lot like when God came to Adam after Adam and Eve had disobeyed and says, Adam, where are you? Did God not know where Adam was? Sure he knew. And so here it is in this story of Jesus going across the lake, um, challenging trip across the lake too, that Jesus meets a man, not Jewish, but a man who when set free from his burdens, his challenges, his demons of life, um, makes a 180 for sure and becomes the kind of person that Jesus is looking for. People who are open, uh, have faith, people who share the story. I'm, I get convinced more and more that every time Jesus said, now don't tell anybody, I'm becoming more and more convinced that that's uh, one of those things, one of those paradoxical things where he says, don't, because he knows they will. You have any demons in your closet? Things that are hindering you from enjoying God's best? Well, I know a man who can set you free. I know a man who can set you free to walk in the goodness of life. His name is Jesus. He's the son of the Most High. And he's here tonight. And there's no need for you to leave this holy place without inviting him to take your demons. See, you can't control them very well, can you? But he has proven he has authority and power. Give them to him. He knows what to do with demons. Pray with you. Lord, as we come before you again tonight, we thank you, we bless you, we praise you in Jesus' name for the story of this one man that you, you traveled across the lake, met him face to face in all of his torment and his history, his his past, his baggage, his trouble, his reputation. You met him where he was. And you took him from where he was into your arms of love and grace. You released him from the bondage of those shackles, physical and spiritual, and set him free to live a life 
that he might be an example of the answered prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Lord, we would pray that we could experience that same freedom, that same power, that the things that rob us of our joy, the joy that you want to give us in Christ, that we could be set free tonight. And we know that you're able. I'm convinced that you want to. Lord, if we would just be like this, this crazy man, and come and fall at your feet and praise you for who you are. God with us. And indeed, when you set us free, we will be free forever. Help us to take this message to our homes, to the people who know us, to the people who knew us and share the good news to the glory of God. Amen. Let's pick up there, um, Luke chapter 8, verse 40, when we come back next time. God bless you and have a good evening.